All right. Welcome back to the Medium Cool Show. I'm still here with my guest, Jake Mueller from the Synonyms Podcast. I'm your host, Felix. And we're talking about a, another horror film from 1965. This time we're going to be talking about Color Me Blood Red, written and directed by Herschel Gordon Lewis, the legendary horror director, probably the most influential horror director of all time. One of them, <laughs> I'd for say sure. one of the most celebrated B filmmakers, and maybe next to Ed Wood, one of the original B horror filmmakers that I can think of. Yeah. Like an absolute legend. Yeah, he's the first guy to do gore effects, like red blood effects in, in movies, like actual, like showing body, like showing gore and like mm -hmm. insides of bodies. Yeah, that's why he's uh, one of the most influential because everyone does that shit like after that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Herschel Gordon Lewis. He's a fascinating filmmaker because we we just talked about Giallo right before this and the movies that are so well crafted and polished to, to a certain extent. Like that's the polar opposite of these movies because like they're so flawed in their execution. They're like, so technical. Yeah. Like just, you always say when we watch them, like these look like shit. The framing is horrible. Yeah. However, there's a charm to these movies that's like unmatched and an audacity and and just like a bravery that he put, that he kind of shows when he crafts these movies. And yeah. I respect the shit out of a lot of his movies, I'll say. And and we were talking about influence. Like he, I think just the tone of his movies and just the gore effects that you had mentioned and the characters being so outlandish. Like this this tone that he kind of insulates is inspired just so much yeah um and that there's a reason why they're so damn fun to watch like over and over again yeah the the yeah. the his movies are trash they are like, they're yeah. trash they're schlock okay. they're really really cheap none there's... of the actors are like professional actors it seems yeah t today we're talking about call me blood red but initially we first watched his oh. his his intro to the horror genre because he made some nudie cuties before this and yeah, then yeah. he decided that he was going to go do a more horror shit and he made a film called blood feast which is considered the first actual real gore film mm -hmm. and that movie is pretty pretty trash pretty bad mm -hmm. um really amateur but there's i guess still a charm to it i mean you have to really be into these types of like horror like of be course. really deep into horror and filmmaking to kind of have an appreciation for it because you can't just like watch this as a regular like <laughs> movie person and just like get it you know it takes it, it it takes a certain type of person to get it yeah you know? i mean we're watching because uh, we're not watching it because we're like oh this is good and we want to no. be entertained you know? we're watching it because like we could see the trajectory of what this movie like the ripple effect that it mainly caused yeah and to see the foundations of horror and that's you know and it helps that these movies are extremely just heightened you know there's no not an ounce of pretension in, in no, any of these no, movies no. Even though, like, what was the Deep South one that we had watched? Oh, 2001 uh, Maniacs? <laughs> like, that movie is... Or 2000 Maniacs? 2000 Maniacs is yeah. a brilliant commentary on, like, the KKK. And, yeah. And, like, and sort of Deep South racism. It's the first hillbilly horror movie. Yeah, It's considered yeah. the first hillbilly horror movie. Really influential, but it's, like, again, like, that movie is sloppy and horribly edited, but... We watch these movies ironically. Uh, very ironically. I'm yeah. not... Uh, it's like we watch them at like past 10 p.m. sort of deal. You never yeah. throw these on like during the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, but th that's the reason why I like it. And that's Grindhouse. Like Grindhouse is not having to focus as heavily on plot character themes and just kind of get lost in the absurdity of what you're seeing on screen in yeah, a certain way. Definitely yeah. 2000 Maniacs doesn't have like for the first, his first two movies, like Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs, there's not really a plot you can follow, mm. I would say. That's why I think no. Color Me Blood Red is actually my favorite one. I'd agree. Out of these ones, because there's actually a plot that you can follow and like a mystery that's going on there. And like a, a, a thing that you can actually follow. And do you, you want to talk about the plot? Yeah. So basically, we're following this schlocky <laughs> artist who lives in this sort of weird secluded. house on the beach. Yeah, the secluded house on the beach. And he's a horrible artist and he can't find like the right color palettes for these paintings. And his wife, who is hilariously just like beating him down and sort of sucking away his soul. I mean, spoiler alert, he ends up murdering her and using her blood to, to paint develop a color palette. Yeah. yeah. And he kind of runs with it. And that's basically, you know, in repetition, we just keep seeing him murder people to 
develop these paintings and they become like a sensation with these art critics and art shows that he takes them to. There's, I didn't mention this when we watched it, but there's a Roger Corman film called Buckets of Blood yeah. with a very similar plot. It's a good plot. Like it's, it's actually a really a good, good plot. Yeah. yeah. It's just the execution like, that's really poor. Of really poor, yeah. <laughs> like it's this, this movie, we, we were laughing because it holds on shots for like an obscene amount of time when he's like coloring these photos and the blood effects just look bad yeah and they hold on it for super long because you could tell like maybe he's he's kind of thinks he's like got the goods with these effects but it might be just a little tad yeah underdeveloped but it's just interesting because it's like an artist that's looking for inspiration and his paintings aren't selling and then finally Mm -hmm. he's he's he sees that like i think he first he cuts himself and then he starts using his own blood, but there's not enough blood to like. That's right. And he's yeah. like tr- tries to cut his wife, and his wife's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" And then like I guess like into a fight, and he kills her, and then he starts yeah. using yeah. her blood for this painting, and he shows it to the art, the 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 gallery owner, the dealer, and they're like, "This is a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. This is a masterpiece. Like, yeah. how much for this?" And he's like, "It's not for sale. Yeah, it's not for sale. His integrity's like through the roof. Yeah, it doesn't make shit, it, which yeah. doesn't make any sense, but whatever. It's it just is. he's just crazy, you know. Yeah. He's like, no, this one's not for sale. And then he ends up committing another murder and making another painting. Mm-hmm. But at first, they're like, "Can you replicate this? Can mm-hmm. you make a? Do you think you could re- remake the glory of this painting?" And he's like, "Yes, I can." Yeah, yeah. And then he kills someone else. I forgot who it was. And then he like makes mm-hmm. another painting with that like out of that another so he needs like a body per painting it seems like that's kind of like the yeah that's the the, the structure of his madness kind of and when he tries to sell this when he goes to the art dealer with the second painting they're like oh my god this is so fucking amazing like how much do you want for it and he he says again it's not for sale it's not for sale even though he's bringing he's like bringing in the painting makes no sense i was very (laughs) i was bewildered by that shit dude I think it's, I think he's attempting to make like a commentary on like, he bled for his work. He and literally people, blood was shed and yeah. like that this art is beyond, you know, capitalism at this point. Yeah. But the problem is, you know, these movies are just so schlocky. You can't really buy into any like no. overarching themes. And the, but like, no, you can there, tell there is no, yeah, he's yeah. trying though. Like he's definitely trying to. It's like, if there yeah. is an overarching theme, it's not on purpose. No, <laughs> you know? I don't know. Yeah. That's the thing. I don't know. I did the same with 3,000 Maniacs. 2,000 or 3,000 2,000 Maniacs. 2,000 Maniacs, yeah. I feel like those are like accidentally like I have a thematic. Yeah, because yeah. 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 they do. <laughs> I think he would just like, wouldn't it be funny to shoot in the Deep South like and these people just get brutally murdered by all these crazy right-wingers and then this is like, what if a painter just went insane and started using blood yeah. to, to, to color his paintings? Nonetheless, like I agree, like this is, I think is the best that I've seen from him because there is a through line and a character that you can semi relate to yeah. while being like a super fun proto slasher, you know, like predates slashers, but he is murdering people and using the blood for painting. So it's yeah. pretty gory at times too, so, which is fun. Yeah. And, and I think with him, I think the reason why he makes his movies is like if the movie and the story is a vehicle for the scenes of yeah. violence that like people, to show the blood yeah. for people, like for people to actually go to the theater, they, they're gonna, they're there for like absolutely those scenes of violence. And the movie is a vehicle for those scenes of violence. Totally. So like 2000 Maniacs, I think that has the best kills in it. Oh, those are gruesome, yeah. <laughs> but Color Me Blood has a better story that you can follow. It's a better story, and I think in all he learned how to actually sometimes frame a shot, sometimes <laughs> make an effective edit. So it's hard to say like it's his best work, but yeah. I think it's like his most digestible. Because other movies, I would just get lost in just thinking about how absurd yeah. they were. But this, this I was like somewhat invested. What do you think his so approach was fun. to like the screenplay and shooting the like what the shooting script was? What do you think his like approach <laughs> of that like was? You think I don't he think was, like, he has it. Do you think he was like plan. making shit up on the way? Yeah. Oh yeah, like he he probably would plan out a scene in his head. But you can tell he's not communicating with his actor or DP at all. He's like, we'll just shoot that. Go sh- go in the jet skis and we'll we'll show you crashing into. Oh each yeah, other. yeah, yeah. And then you because that scene is so haphazard, like nothing's blocked. I think he's just shooting things happening, and like people will walk it like at weird paces, you know, like everything's off. Yeah, yeah. But still, there's I think we just there's a charm yeah. that we both really grasp onto with these movies and. Actually, so in that scene with on the jet skis and she, she throws the pole at, he throws the pole oh, at the yes. girl. That's actually the first time you see 
like a, a stab, an actual like weapon to skin stab in a movie. In a because movie the other, ever? In, in the other ones, he doesn't have, he doesn't have, he, he cuts away, he like cuts away. He cuts away. You, you don't see the impact. And you just see the dismembered bodies. That yeah. is like one of the actual first impact shots. Is like that, that in cinema ski. or in his movies? In his movies, and I think maybe even in cinema. Yeah, I mean, because you look back at Psycho or Peeping Tom, like they'd usually cut away. No, they don't. They don't show. I think this might be the yeah. first actually yeah. like weapon to skin on screen impact yeah. on that jet ski. Thing. Uh, that seems brutal. So yeah, he he really is really a good. fucking like kind of a genius, bro. Mm-hmm. Like he's like way ahead of his time. Like again, I love him. I do. I and do. he this was like near the end of that the boom of the gore effects because yeah, they're like they're, it was getting too saturated. Even though he made a few other gore movies but like definitely by the end of color me red it, it definitely just like like there's so much more that you like when i there was so much more expected by the end of the movie yeah can we talk about the third act and how horrendously like paced it is <laughs> yeah 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 you can yeah they introduce these four like college age kids that go to this beach to camp out where this guy lives in like the final 30 minutes so he does all these character setups and like their journey to the beach. And then this is the final 10 minutes is basically him attempting to kill one of these girls who strays away from his friend, their friends. And it's just the most oddly paced, just horribly executed third acts I've ever seen in a horror movie. You kept thinking the movie was going to get to that, that point of just like the high point of, of horror, you know, and then like the chase scene or, you know, the kill or whatever. It just kept dragging out for so long. I mean, yeah. It was just crazily paced and, yeah. That's what we're saying. He doesn't know how to write a script or yeah. edit anything. Yeah. So, yeah. So the woman yeah. that originally wants to buy his paintings, daughter and her friends go mm-hmm. to this beach to party or whatever. And yeah. then the daughter runs into the painter and the painter's like, oh, let me paint you. Let me paint you. And then like, she's like, he's like, don't tell anyone though or whatever. And then she goes to get painted and then he ties her up. And then it's just like the most anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah. Like you would think that he kills her and they don't know what happened. And then later on the mom will come back and investigate and then he kills her and then we get like the final yeah climax but it's just like that's what i thought all the characters come in and discover what's going on and then they like stop him and then it's over yeah yeah and then there's a weird book end from the beginning to the end where they burn a painting oh yeah yeah i don't know what that meant I don't know again meant. i don't know purposeful <laughs> allegory or just he thought it'd be a cool shot i don't know but yeah, I agree. It's just, what the fuck is the the pace of that? It's like a whole other movie introduced in the third act that he tries to cram in. And he just like, I could, you could just like, he was improvising the final 30 minutes and especially that final scene in the in his house. Yeah. Just, you're like, where the fuck is this going? Um, but I think on the strength of a really good idea that, as you were saying, and some pretty influential kills like midway, you know, towards the end, there's there's a lot of this movie to enjoy, even though the third act is just over, kind of just a big limp dick moment, you know. I remember we were watching it and your roommate came in and started watching it with us. And then he like stopped watching it because he was like, what the fuck is I was going to reference that earlier. We were saying about how it's so inaccessible to no, people. No, it's not. Yeah. My roommate's not like super, super into like classic movies. So no, he like, watches like, what the fuck are you guys watching? He they, watches movies to be like entertained, you know, yeah. like, he's not interested in like the schlocky cheap bullshit. <laughs> so I think it's just cause like we're filmmakers. So we have a, we just, we're just thinking like, what the fuck is he doing? Like type mm-hmm. shit. He's, it's not for like mass audiences. Like, uh, you don't, absolutely not. You don't just like put this on like with the family mm-hmm. or whatever. This is like an acclimated <laughs> taste for watching it. Ironically. I would love to watch this with my kids one day though. Cause they would, be a family of filmmakers, you know, I'll be studying Herschel Gordon Lewis and yeah. John Waters and all that. But John Waters, we were, I'm a, one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. I don't think he would exist without Herschel Gordon Lewis. No, he ways. definitely did not. He, he, he talks about him. He talks about him. He's Herschel so, Gordon I mean, not to denigrate John Waters and what he does, but I think seeing what Herschel Gordon Lewis accomplished, or accomplished in quotes, I guess, Gave him the juice to 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 find his own voice. For so, sure. No, he's that, super influential. Super influential. Like you can't knock the dude. Like no matter how bad his movies yeah. were, there wouldn't be a certain like it just yeah. And he's considered the Godfather of Gore, which is a title also given to Lucio Fulci, by the way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, they both started it all. So it's they're yeah pretty <laughs> lit. If you fuck with Herschel Gordon Lewis, leave a comment below. Which one do you like the most? I, I fuck with this. I, I've seen I've seen this and then Two Thousand Maniacs and Blood Feast, and I also watched Same. The Wizard of Gore. 
Still got to see that. Which is pretty funny. We should watch that one. I would love to watch that. It's it's pretty ridiculous. But there's like a mood to it. Yeah. I mean... They're not scary movies. They're not. Not at all. They're not scary at all. But I wonder if people who saw it in the theaters when it first came out were like, (laughs) oh, oh. Like, I don't know. I mean, if they've never seen... They're probably really young. Someone get impaled by by something. Like, that would be pretty shocking to see. Yeah. I'm sure it sent some people out of the cinemas. But also let us know, like, I'm curious, what's your favorite movie by him? Like, is there one, like, secret masterpiece that we haven't mentioned? Because he has a very bizarre filmography. Yeah, know? so and i got to watch The Gorgor Girls. That's, yeah. that's another one. I think that's the one they show in the movie Juno when he goes oh, over right. to Jason Bateman's house. And he's like, the, he's like, she's like, the god, like, the, the master of violence is Dario Argento. I didn't know. That. I don't and, remember and that he, at all. And then wow. he, Jason Bateman's like, no, it's Herschel Gordon Lewis. T- <laughs> and then they watch Four Girl Girls. God. You know? Yeah. I don't remember that at all. That's such a fucking like Diablo Cody moment to happen. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. mention these super obscure horror movies that like no fucking adult living yeah. in the suburbs would know who Hersh- 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 and Lewis is. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's cool. That's mm-hmm. a cool thing. Anyways, uh, hope you liked the video. Peace.